Hello, everybody. Today is Lecture 7 <clears throat> in terms of uh, the study of hermeneutics. And um, right now what we're doing is we're getting ready to apply the rules. I went over the rules. I explained the rules uh, from the perspective of uh, proving them that proving that they are uh, biblical rules and uh, explaining why those rules are important, how they work. We're gonna we're focusing on Acts chapter eight verses fifteen through seventeen. You're beginning to write your own um, exegesis of that um, as you apply the hermeneutical rules to be able to draw out that interpretation. And uh, always remembering that you know there is only one interpretation. There's only one truth. There's not many interpretations, and there's not many truths. Um, there's just one, and so we're going to let the scripture interpret the scripture, because it's so easy to, you know, get uh, tunnel vision, if you would, and become uh, very myoptic and 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 um, centered on one, you know, idea or concept at the exclusion of all the rest of the information if you're not very careful. And so the rules help us to make sure that we don't jump to conclusions until we've received all of the information on the subject. And so, um, you know, today I'm going to show you a little bit of a different way to approach the word study, you know, and I don't want anyone to feel like, well, you know, somehow I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this because it goes beyond my education level or my skill set. Because once again, with a computer, it's very easy to do this. You know, I could actually show you how to do it with Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, which is something that is easy for everyone to um, acquire and to navigate through. Um, and hopefully uh, you'll be able to, if that's all you have, you'll be able to translate this information over into the usage of Strong's Exhaustive Concordance or other types of concordances like that. Um, these days, it's just so easy uh, to have, you know, the aid of <clears throat> these electronic programs that I tend to just focus there. And it also, of course, helps to expedite the process. So when we first studied, the, uh, our first word that we studied, the Holy Ghost, and we begin to categorize all the various different scriptures on, uh, on the Holy Ghost and, and then what the, you know, the scripture was actually saying about the Holy Ghost, if it was revealing something about his person or something about his action or something that he was responsible for, you know, something that he actually was doing. We categorized those to begin to really uh, get a feel of, <clears throat> you know, the breadth of his uh, responsibilities, if you would. I mean, he was sent from the Father, as it were, by the direction of Jesus. Um, and so, and certainly by the... Uh, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, and we see that he's involved in every dimension of salvation. And, you know, we're going to, we're setting, we're basically collecting all of the information. We're beginning to distill out what we, what are, what we're concluding from the results that we're getting from the Bible. And as we do this, we're going to, we're getting to get to a place where we're going to start applying all, making sure that we're applying all the rules of hermeneutics uh, to each one of our conclusions that we're going to begin to derive here um, as we progress. So, as I said, last time all we did was we just, you know, basically put in a, the word Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost and then recognized, you know, as we were studying all the other um, words that are used synonymously or alternatively for the Holy Ghost, which, you know, one being um, simply spirit, spirit of the Lord, spirit of God, so that we could collect all this information. Well, today, I know if, you, if, you've lo if you're looking at the outline that I gave initially, you know, I said well, for, for, for what we're going to do first is we're going to um, explore the word Holy Ghost. Then we were going to, secondly, we were going to compare the different salvation events in the book of Acts. And then we were going to study the word salvation. Well, I thought, well, what we would do instead is just go ahead and jump to the word salvation and look at it from a different perspective and then go ahead and compare the three, um, the three or four examples in the book of Acts. 
that show the whole of salvation as it were taking place within a group. And um, I thought, well, let's, let's switch these around for the single purpose of really making sure that everybody appreciates what the Bible says about salvation. And, you know, one of the things that you can do here is you could start writing out the verses of Scripture that you already know, like John 3.16, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, how, how you know, how much easier could you make it? You know, uh, Acts 16, verse 31, Paul's response to the jailer was, when he said, what must I do to be saved? Paul just simply said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved in your house. So he makes it really very simple. Um, in, in Acts chapter 8, uh, later on in the, in the chapter, when um, Philip is addressing the eunuch, uh, his, his examination is very basic. The eunuch says, what prevents me from being baptized? And um, that's another word that we're getting ready to look up here after we compare the three uh, examples of salvation. Baptism is going to be important. And, and then Philip just simply says, look, as long as you believe with all of your heart. And, and really what he's equating in, uh, to uh, this too is that uh, the eunuch is going to be saved simply by believing with all of his heart and that a testimony of that salvation is going to be the action or activity of baptism. And so, you know, once again, as I begin to go through this, really what we're doing is we're starting to pair out a whole bunch of different denominational beliefs um, as we begin to get at these various different ideas. And once again, we're not propagating some kind of bias or propagating some, you know, dogma that we want to teach people. I'm not. I don't want to teach people uh, dogma. I, I don't want to. I don't want to indoctrinate people. I want. I don't want anyone to be my disciple, so to speak. I want everybody to be a disciple of the Word of God. I want you to go to the Word of God and let the Word of God indoctrinate you. I want your um, and we should all want our belief to be what God has said, and then ultimately we're going to get his results. If we're not getting his results, then certainly uh, we believe something uh, incorrectly or we're doing something incorrectly. We're not agreeing with God and walking with God the way he wants us to. You know, there's been time in my life, I mean, when I was an undergraduate, that I asked one of my professors about a certain question about the uh, the Word of God, and and he was a, he's a very well known, very astute professor, uh, actually one of the translators of the NIV. And he says to me, you know, um, well, yeah, what you're saying is true from a biblical perspective, but it's not our experience. Well, that's invalid. That should not be a you know part of our approach of hermeneutical rules to ask ourselves the question, well, is this our experience? <laughs> you know, which we should return this thing around and say, wait a minute, I've got evidence here that there's something wrong because the results or the experience that God is describing in his word isn't mine. <laughs> so I want my experience to conform to the word of God. I do not want the word of God to conform to my experience. So certainly whether people have intended to do this or not. And of course, in this particular instance, this was a guy with a, not just a THD, but a PhD, and not to undermine a THD, because THDs um, in many cases are just as hard to get as PhDs. Uh, just to make the point that he was a scholar, he was a very bright uh, person. However, he had adopted a rule, either knowingly or unknowingly, of hermeneutics that certainly does not have a valid reason from the scripture to observe. We shouldn't be saying, well, is this our experience or not? And that, that our experience is, then is going to be the, the proof or the justification as to whether or not uh, God's word is for us today or this particular part of God's word is for us today. So what we're going to do here today is, once again, we're going to study the word salvation and maybe we might even have enough time to start comparing the, th the three salvific events, um, four salvific events uh, in uh, the book of Acts. And so what we want to do today is we want to get right to the primary word that is used in the Greek language 
um, for salvation. And we're going to actually do our search today using a Greek word uh, rather than the English equivalent. And remember, what we're going to be doing is we're gathering synonyms, we're gathering other, um, you know, words and and uh, even topics that would s express the same uh, subject to us. And and by the way, let me just say this: once we really start moving into asking um, the questions that we need, the hermeneutical questions about our conclusions, or at least applying the hermeneutical rules. Uh, to our conclusions. We're going to also be consulting uh, commentaries um, and especially uh, one of the things that we're going to do before that is we're going to look at uh, dictionaries, really good theological workbook dictionaries um, that really go after the meaning of words, original meaning of words. And you know it, it, there's also another important thing to do here and I'll just make mention of it is that to also ultimately then go back and and look at the Hebrew words that were used in the Old Testament. Uh, look at the English words, for example, that were used, or the, whatever language you are most comfortable with, uh, that were used in the Old Testament, uh, that were searching in the New Testament. And then look at um, particular uh, bridges, if you would, like the, the Septuagint is a great bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament because, of course, the Septuagint is written in Greek. And so now we've got a 2nd century B.C. contrast and comparison of what that Hebrew word uh, was, was thought to, uh, to mean, to be, to, to mean in, in, um, in the Greek language. So uh, the primary word for, to save or salvation in, in the uh, New Testament is zotza. And uh, once again, if you've got a computer program, um, it's real easy to get at that word if you're just using a, 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 a strong exhaustive concordance. Once again, you can easily get at that word just by looking up save. Um, if you have something like logos, uh, all you have to do is uh, point click on the Greek word and then you're going to get um, a lot of the other words that are derived from that root and it's going to be you know, make this thing a whole lot faster for you uh, to really collect a lot of information. But what we want to do is we want to look at saved or salvation or deliverance, um, what it means to be rescued, uh, forgiven. Um, there's see all these various different words. Of course, that's another word, Greek word, offices. But we're, we're going to look at a lot of different words as you begin to move through this that you know is it means the same thing, justification, reconciliation. All of these are talking to us about this wonderful event of salvation and, and the consequences of that salvation. And then by uh, context, we get to understand maybe a little bit more than from these other alternative words um, you know, who's saved, who isn't saved, how difficult is it to get saved, you know, what is what conditions do you have to, to meet to be saved. And then once we've, we've, we've gone through this once again and, and we've, we've collected all the information and we've categorized it as to what it pertains to, for example, with saved, it could be deliverance, it could be, uh, it means to be whole uh, or delivered from a, uh, a demon spirit or delivered from sickness or disease. Um, cause that's a means healing, salvation, deliverance and, 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 and more. And so, but once we get through collecting all the different information, categorizing that information and, um, looking at then what we would then be able to glean from a word, uh, dictionary, a, a word study dictionary, like theological workbook, uh, dictionary, the new Testament or other types of dictionaries, um, then what we're going to do is we're going to um, find even more potential words that we may, may have overlooked <clears throat> that we could utilize to get more information about salvation with specific interest in what you have to do, what conditions do you have to meet in order to be saved. And then our ultimate connection is going to be then salvation and and the role of the Holy Spirit, and then the results. And once again, asking the question about those people at Samaria, 
when they called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and were baptized, were they saved? And I, I'm certain that our conclusion, <clears throat> and my bias at this point in time is, our conclusion is that yes, they were absolutely saved. And so then we're gonna let the, the word God um, clearly um, support that and, and justify that, or we're gonna have to back up and say, wait a minute, there's a possibility they weren't saved. And you know we're gonna find out that that's not the case. And of course, I'm saying this now in, in somewhat of a biased way, just to make sure that everybody that is listening to this that has any true inclination of well, how easy it is to be saved uh, by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that you know where I'm going here. And, I, and, and unfortunately, people are going to write into this many different things, and they have written into this many different things, you know, that you have to belong to a certain type of a church, you have to you know, belong to a certain denomination, you have to do a certain number of things, um, and then this wonderful act and work of grace uh, wrought for us by Christ Jesus is applied to you. Well, you know, that's their bias, and does it stand up in the Word of God? So, what we're going to do is, we're going to take, once we've um, identified the Greek word, and if you're using BLB or you're use if you're using BLB Blue Line Bible, um, all you do is you point and click and you go to the um, uh, a section there that's uh, basically the interlinear, and you just click on that and it's going to bring you to all of the words and a verse of scripture. Just click on salvation if you're using Logos, then just uh, once again open up the uh, KJV, um, and then just click on save. And it's going to bring you, or just point and say, that it's going to bring you to Word Info. And then you're going to be able to see the Greek words on that, or the Greek word on that. You're going to have a selection underneath that. And we'll begin to expand that a little bit more. But just go to the uh, blue linked um, Zotso, click on that. It will open up into a beautiful pie chart and a lot of information, uh, which helps us to get at you know, at what we want to, what we want to, <coughs> what we want to find very, very quickly, list out BDAG, uh, LSJ, um, you know, the WSNT dictionary, and on and on and on. I mean, it just, it, it is such a, a wonderful thing for all of us who are really going after uh, studying. So what we're going to do is we'll just, we'll click, we'll choose it, and, um, then we're going to take it and and once we cl clicked on or selected the Greek word, <clears throat> we're now going to go into um, our search field and we're going to paste it in to our search engine and then we're just going to click on that and bring up all the verses of scripture in the Bible that has to do with Zotza. And then we're going to search that way. So let me... See if I can get this thing done here as well. And then we can start exploring as soon as I get my mouse to work properly. We start exploring all these words on so so. Um, let's see, what else can I say about this? Well, there's probably a lot of things to say. Um, I think that I've already mentioned to you, I'm still waiting for my computer to come up, sorry. I think I've already mentioned to you all the verses of scripture that you've already, that you already know about this subject, that you want to go ahead and um, you know, begin to write those out. Everything that you already have so far, go ahead and write those things out. Let's see, I think, um, you know, with my, my searches here, I've got the way that it's used in the Septuagint, uh, the way it's used in the New Testament, the way it's used among the Apostolic Fathers, the way that it's used in the um, Apocrypha, uh, the way that Josephus used it, and the way that Philo used this particular word. So, well, a lot of a lot of study, eh? So what I'm going to do, of course, is I'm just going to start with the uh, 110 results that I got just from the New Testament using Zotza. Whew. 
got a lot of information to sort through, 110 results. And of course, we're going to categorize them um, in, in the different places that they belong because not everything that is going to be said about Zozo is going to talk about you know, what we must do to be saved or, or help us derive a definition uh, about salvation so that we can then apply it to the church or rather to the group of Samaria and be able to answer the question, were they saved and had they received the spirit of the Lord um, and through that salvation? And um, one of the verses of scripture that should be a cornerstone to this as we're moving into this would be, for example, uh, John chapter 3, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Okay, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Jesus addressing Nicodemus on his need to be born again and its equivalence to coming into the kingdom and being a part of the kingdom and its association with the kingdom of God. And so, you know, this is a radical statement, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Um, so that which is born of the Holy Ghost becomes, you know, part of the Holy Ghost or, or begotten of the Holy Ghost. Or how do you want to say that? <laughs> uh, it's easier to say that which is born of a of the flesh is flesh or that which is born of, of someone who is human is, is human. That which is born of a human being is a human being. Now, the Lord's going to say that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit, is of the Spirit, okay? Belongs to a new race, a new category, and then, you know, that causes you to step back and go, wait a minute, I need to study that out a little bit more. That's pretty radical thought. How much do I belong to God? And so we understand salvation and born again and a new creation and a new creature. All of those, all of those words, although they aren't a purely a synonym they certainly are those topics that you want to study because they are synonymous okay to be born again is is equivalent in other words to be being saved um then you know being begotten of god being the sons of god being the children of god uh being um a new creation a new creature all of those are synonymous. And so then we get to, as, as we investigate this, we get to understand that much more about those, you know, particular verses of scripture that are categorically the same as uh, something we would refer to in terms of the work of the Holy Ghost, having been sealed with the Spirit, for example. Well, we know that that is something that happens when you're born again. And, you know, that's really what we want to ultimately, um, you know, get at here as we line all these verses of Scripture up and see that commonality in the category specifically of salvation. What does it mean to be saved? What is the work of the Holy Ghost in salvation? And then specifically, one of the questions that, we're, that we have here is when you're born again, do you receive the Holy Spirit? And um, so... Let's start off with Matthew 121. Um, and 121 is once again um, referring to that work of the Holy Ghost, but specifically what the Holy that work of the Holy Ghost would be doing through Christ Jesus. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And now all of a sudden we get it, we get a word here, Jesus, uh, which ultimately is a um, word that was used uh, in the Greek language long ago, um, even before the days of Jesus, you know, which we would see in the Septuagint uh, to refer to the, the name Joshua, uh, Yehoshua, uh, which literally means uh, Yehoah's, uh, Yeshua or Yehoah's salvation. So that's actually Jesus' name is actually another synonymous word for salvation. <laughs> that's what he does. And, it, that, and all authority is given in that name for the purpose of salvation. And there's one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ the righteous. And, you know, once again, we're collecting more information concerning 
who he who he is and, and the work of grace that he does. Okay, now uh, Matthew eight twenty five is the next word that we come to that we have that I have in my list of the hundred and ten results uh, in hundred and three verses that uses the word zotso, and it and here we see another application for she for she saith with or forgive me. Uh, Matthew eight twenty five and his disciples came to him and 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 awoke him saying Lord save us we perish um, so you know we get an antonym here perish being the opposite of being saved to um, you know to to be destroyed uh, those ultimately are, are important words uh, and there's something to glean here and we do it we do it very guardedly but. It just simply, here is a request being made by the disciples for Jesus to save them. How difficult is it for him to respond? <clears throat> and you're going to see, you know, that same thing uh, with uh, the, the man who was a, uh, who, who was um, uh, a, a, a paralytic and who his four friends um brought him to a meeting that Jesus was having in Capernaum. Uh, they tore off the roof to let him down. Jesus said, your sins be forgiving, are forgiven you. And then, you know, the whole story of where um, the, the, the Pharisees are really taken back by that. And Jesus says, well, what is it easy? Is it easier to say your sins be forgiven you? Arise, take up your bed and, and walk. And so that's why, once again, forgiveness becomes... A very important word for us to associate and make synonymous with salvation because it is and how difficult was it to get Christ Jesus then to have this kind give this kind of opportunity to the paralytic and how difficult was it for the paralytic then to respond you know we want to collect that kind of information as we go along and see that once again, Jesus didn't go tell him to do a bunch of thin things. He just simply said, you know, rise, take up your bed and walk. So um, then the next one that we come to, and I don't know how many we're going to be able to get through this in terms of categorizing them, but let's just keep going for just a little bit. And then, you know, I think that what we'll do is, and I think I've given you enough of a start here to really start working through all of these verses of Scripture once again, think about all the ones that you know, and then it helps you get helps then uh, to uh, helps to get at more of those words that you want to look up and categorize. Romans ten nine and ten, you know, um, and um, you know if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, uh, you shall be saved. Well, that's making it very easy. Shows also that resurrection then becomes a part or raised from the dead becomes a part of those words that we want to look up and understand with respect to salvation and of course not at the the, the resurrection of the body but as Paul applied it um, in Colossians chapter 3 if you then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above and you know um, once again getting at how how difficult was was it for people to get saved what did people have to do? What were the expectations? What were the criteria of salvation? That's once again what we're getting at. I know I'm being a bit redundant, but it's important for me, I think, to overemphasize that just to make sure that we're staying on track. Um, she said, this is, of course, speaking of the woman with the issue of blood in Matthew 9, 21, which is the next verse of scripture we come to. She said within herself, if I may touch his garment, I will be, I shall be whole. Uh, whole is another way in which Zotso is to be translated uh, in the English word gives us another synonym helps us to understand once again um, how easy it is to receive when a person's heart is set on having what only Christ Jesus can give okay and uh, in, in many respects you might even actually apply that to what Philip was saying to the eunuch just believe with all of your heart and there was a a confidence a certainty there um, you know, which all basically then ties into the word believe. So going on, Matthew 9, 22, really saying the same thing. Jesus turned to her and said to her daughter, be a good comfort. Your faith has saved you, has made you whole. And the woman was saved or made whole from that hour. Um, 
somebody might say, well, you know, I, I don't want to put this in the category of salvation. Well, you certainly don't want to eliminate it. Yes, it has to do with someone's being healed. Um, but there, once again, it it, it's, it's just what Jesus said. What's well, easy for me to say, your sins are forgiven you or be made whole. So having been delivered from sin, having your sins forgiven is absolutely the um, result of salvation. Salvation it's, it's absolutely equivalent then to salvation. And some people want to break it out and say, well, you know, we're being saved. Well, you know what? You better be careful with using um, that particular um, you know, approach to perhaps translating the participle or however you viewed that Greek word in that particular context or the verse that might refer to that or seem to suggest that. And you better understand what it means right now in terms of being born again versus, you know, the being a part of the first resurrection and your body being raised up and uh, from the dead and, you know, uh, the, the, that which is now and that which is in also in the future. Um, and then understand all of the bridge scriptures between those two. Um, understanding that we're kept by the power of God, for example, as, as Peter said in 1 Peter. Understanding, as, as Paul addressed the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that um, I believe it's verse 8, that he shall confirm us unto the end, he, which is much the same as keeping us, he will confirm us unto the end blameless. Um, as Jude said, now unto him was able to keep us from falling and to, that's radical, isn't it? And to present us, present us faultless. Man, that's pretty radical, isn't it? The keeping power of being saved now to the uh, future events of those things in the finality of, of it all. His keeping power, his, that once again, the work of grace that takes place because salvation is part of our life. I want to bring all of these things in it so that we don't start, you know, parsing out salvation as something that we've got to wait for later and just hope so, because that's not what's, it's not what's being presented. You know, it's not what Paul presents in Colossians chapter one, verse 22. And so, you know, when he, when he says, you know, that, so, that the forgiveness of sins and, and what Christ Jesus has done for us has resulted in us being in a place of being, un, you know, that he would present us unreprovable, unrebukable, <laughs> without blame before him. Uh, and so, you know, all of these additional, you know, descriptions of salvation and what the keeping power of Christ Jesus and the grace of God that is given and the way that grace is applied and the way that grace is received uh, is so important to us to, uh, to categorically place within the understanding of of salvation and how easy it is to be saved like 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 what Paul said in Romans chapter 3 for example when he said his blood was uh, shed not for our sins only but also for the sins of the whole world <laughs> how that God reconciled the whole world it was reconciling the whole world bringing that opportunity of change you know and then okay so this is what God has done for us it is it is given to whosoever will we're collecting that kind of information the whole world um you know anyone who calls upon the name of the lord and then that is the opportunity that is set before us and then with that opportunity how what must a person do in order to have that provision applied to their life so hopefully that then helps to broaden this concept for you and helps to uh, also give you an ability to grab more of the information and gives you a sense that we have to have more than just one single word. That one single word, if we search that off that one single word, even if we're searching in the original language as we are right now using Zozo in the Greek language, still there are going to be a, there's going to be a lead in to a lot of other synonymous or equivalent words and topics that we must also consider so that we not only know what saved means but we also know when saved happens <laughs> and um yeah so let me just grab just maybe just a couple more verses of scripture and then just for the sake of time at least start getting into contrasting and comparing 
um, the, the salvific formulas, if you would, the salvation formulas. And, and of course, there's a lot of information here too, but I know that uh, being is that I am on lecture seven, um, and I still got a lot of things to do with you in terms of applying the hermeneutical rules. Um, I'm going to have to be more brief than I would want to be. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to scroll down through Matthew real quick, and I'm just going to jump over to Mark um, and just and, and let's just grab a verse of scripture out of there. Um, something that may be unique. Um, yeah, let's go. Let's just look at Mark 656 and whether it says and whithersoever he entered into a village or city or country they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they may touch him uh, if, if may touch him if it were but with the border of his garment and as many as touched him were saved they were made whole application once again is being um, delivered from their sickness being delivered from their disease um, so categorically it belongs to uh, that application but once again uh, it is it, it its overtones what speak to salvation mark 835 for whosoever shall save his life shall lose it and now we're going to put a potentially a category of of uh, conditions here with mark 835 whosoever shall save his life shall lose it but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels the same shall save it and so you know we don't want to make it a criteria, you know, in absence of the simplicity of salvation. We just want to understand it in terms of the context of an exchange of life, because that's what reconciliation means. Whether you're looking at catalasso or catalege, it is a change by exchange, okay? The exchange of our life or his life. And how difficult is that? Well, he made that exchange for us available by way of a miracle, simply by calling upon his name. Um, and so, once again, we want to continue to get at this. We want to understand, you know, grace grace application. The grace application is that, once again, the Holy Spirit is leading us uh, to Jesus. Jesus is <laughs> revealing the Father to us. And, and Father is, is, is bringing us to Christ Jesus in, in, in that way. And in, in the same respect, and ultimately we became a, we, we become a gift to Christ Jesus, and we're kept by His power and kept through His name, as Jesus said in John chapter seventeen in the priestly uh, uh, prayer that He uh, gave us there. Father, keep through the, the keep through Your own name those that You have given to Me. <laughs> so all that come to Christ Jesus are drawn to him by the Father. So if anybody even has a desire for Christ Jesus, that then, uh, then they have that desire and they have come to him simply because of this divine act of the Father that brought them unto Christ Jesus. So beautiful. And um, once again, back to the work of the Holy Ghost, many of the things that we did not actually cover or go over in... Um, our study of the Holy Ghost simply because for, for for time's sake that hopefully you've already become more appreciative of as you really took hold of all of those things that are said about the work of the Holy Ghost in salvation, especially in the Gospel of John. Um, let's go to uh, Luke just real quickly. Um, Luke 9.56 for the Son of Man, speaking of Christ Jesus, a synonym for Jesus, God's salvation, is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And um, that, of course, was his response to the disciples getting all upset because he was, you know, being rejected. Um, and so they said, should we call down fire out of heaven? And Jesus says, look, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, I've come here to seek and to save that which is lost. John, uh, Luke 17, 33, whosoever shall seek to save his life. That's the same thing pretty much as we said before. So let's just go quickly to John. And, and of course, John is rich on, on, the, on the, the clarity of, of salvation and the saving work of Christ Jesus. Uh, John 3, 17, for God sent not a son into the world could condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Once again, it isn't just an elect few. He's talking about the world, okay, the whole of the world, whosoever will. And you're going to see whosoever wills over and over again. And that's another good word to search, whosoever will, whosoever. 
you know and once again once we get into denominational classifications we get into a place where there are denominational creeds and beliefs and doctrines that ultimately say well no you salvation's not for everyone um, it's just for an elect few, those who God has chosen, and that's why some people re reject the gospel and, and others accept the gospel. Well, you're going to have to be really careful with that. You're going to have to make sure that that truly is uh, the whole counsel of God and that you don't have any contradictions. And, and the reality of it is, is you're going to have contradictions because it, this is for the whole world, not for our sins only, but for the whole world. That's said over and over again. The salvation's for the whole world. It's said over and over again. It's it's the whosoever wills. Otherwise, the Lord would have just kept, kept it as just the elect, okay? And, you know, and, and so then someone wants to get into salvation and start breaking that out. Well, then you're going to have to deal with words like predestination, foreknowledge, and you're going to have to understand the meaning of those and the context meaning of those in such a way that they don't violate the hermeneutical rules and once again create contradictions. Okay, so um, let me just go quickly. Uh, let's grab uh, let's grab a something up oh, there's so many uh things to say in john isn't there there's uh so uh but let's just go to acts real quickly um acts 221 and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved well how simple can you make it and how many verses of scripture actually say the same thing and does that ever remove any complexity um, out of the equation, does that ever make the conditions of salvation so simplified? And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. My goodness, here he is salvation. He, here he is the Savior. Here he is reaching out to, the, uh, to all mankind. As Peter says, God's not willing that any per perish, but everyone should come to the knowledge of the truth, that everyone should be saved. And um, here's the Savior willing that everyone be saved. And he's, and he's reaching out to all mankind, just waiting for whosoever will to call. And that's the simplicity of salvation, as the way Peter expresses it here in Acts 2.21. And, of course, we're going to study that model here in just a little bit and see what he says about that. And But we want to go ahead... And, and, and I don't want you to cut this short. I want you to continue on searching through the scripture, you know, verifying that salvation really is that simple, that it is simply nothing more than believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, confessing your sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then, you know, <clears throat> understand that role of what John is saying there in 1 John uh, one nine and being careful that you maybe don't take it quite as far as uh, for example someone like Charles Finney would have taken it and try to remember every sin that you ever committed and, and then repent over it of course if it comes to mind certainly that doesn't seem to be something that you would uh, you know uh, want to refuse of course say you know for lord forgive me but the bottom line of it is what does really the scripture have to say how complicated does the scripture have to say it and then when you look at first corinthians or first john 1 9 you look at it in the context and you make sure that the application is correct and look at it in the old testament look at it in the model of application because the things that are important to us jesus actually presented them in his own body in his own life he showed and demonstrated them there were also examples of it in the old testament in many cases and then there's certain the application of it in the New Testament you know it's um, so it, it's very difficult to go wrong here uh, if you're really ob objectively approaching this wanting the whole counsel of God and once again applying those um, hermeneutical rules um, so let's see here um, you know, for the sake of time, I think that I'm going to wait on the contrast and comparison. Um, maybe I can get it done here. Uh, there's so many more verses of Scripture on salvation. I'll hit one more, Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're going to get that over and over and over again. There are going to be specifics, like I said, in Romans 10, 9, where, it's going to, where you're going to hear, 
If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Once again, there's a little bit more details in the conditions of calling upon the name of the Lord. And it really is as, as simple as calling out, Lord, come save me, come help me, come deliver me. And, and understanding the specific application is I want to be delivered not from some you know, consequence, some terrible event that I'm in. I want to be delivered from the power of sin. I want to be delivered from the, the, uh, the reign of, of, of terror that is over my life that belongs to the realms of, of sin and iniquity and darkness. It belongs to that place where every unredeemed person is under the power and the authority of the prince and the power of the air. As Paul, you know, once again, as he begins to describe that with those results of salvation, that we were once, you know, blind, we were once in darkness, as he says in Ephesians chapter 2, we were once children of disobedience, but not any longer. Um, very broad subject, salvation. It's facts. It's, um, uh, I, it's on every page of the Bible because <laughs> the whole of the Bible is about redemption. It's about salvation. And it's about God's love for the whole world, not for some people in the world. And it's not a limited love. It is a love that reaches to every human being, okay? And to try to somehow believe that salvation is limited to only a small group of people in a certain situation, you know, you're, you're a disciple of man because you're not going to be able to prove that from the scripture. You're going to have to go up and literally, I mean, violate um, so many verses of scripture that are going to contradict that idea. That's why it's so important to write down all of the things that you believe about God and then say, you know, how, how much of the Bible that I read, it doesn't agree with you know, what, I, what I'm thinking. And so let's go ahead and and real quickly, it, it get a start on comparing uh, the salvation events. And let's go ahead and start in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Uh, when, oh, what, 3,000? Uh, yeah, 3,000 Jews were saved. And my goodness, you talk about uh, having a hard place, uh, having a difficult place to preach. And people are always talking about, you know, we travel all over the world and, and travel throughout the United States of America, preaching the gospel. And of course, it's enough just to preach in your own city. <laughs> and everybody's always saying the same thing. Oh, this is a hard place. It's difficult, you know, because this and that and the other thing. <laughs> this is the most difficult place on the planet to preach was in Jerusalem, right after Jesus had been crucified. So let's see, where do we want to start here? Um, I'm trying my best at this moment in time to get to Acts 2.38. And I think I'm going to get there here. Uh, this time, I keep as I'm multitasking, I keep putting in the wrong reference. Uh, so Peter says unto them, "Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall be you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost." Pretty simple, isn't it? Now, if we just take that verse of scripture and we start breaking it apart, um, then what we're going to begin to deal with is you know, several different ways that we could go with this. We could look at a salvation formula here. Uh, one of the first things that we're going to be asking ourselves is uh, this question, is it as simple as Jesus made it? Is it as, is as simple as it has been stated as we begin to contrast and compare all of these verses of Scripture um, that we found with regards to being forgiven, forgiven of our sins, saved, etc.? So, of course, um, Peter's talking to the whole of Israel. That's the context. He says, for the promises unto you and to your children, to your children's children, uh, uh, so as, and to all that are far off and as many as the Lord our God should call. So it, it, it extends it to every generation. Now, if we just stop there with the salvific formula, you know, we may actually begin to conclude things that um, are problematic, Okay. Uh, to the whole of salvation because it you could say well this looks like that you need to repent okay well surely you surely you do that's part of calling upon the name of the lord you need to be baptized okay well was does everybody need to be baptized it certainly is the commission of the lord jesus christ you know as many as uh you know preach the gospel those that believe should be saved and and of course we can look at the baptism formula and we're going to look at the baptism formula as jesus said and commanded all men to be baptized once we start really studying out the word baptism 
baptism. So we're going to hold off on some conclusions, but we're going to certainly list out the things that Peter says. Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, well, does that somehow um, override what Jesus said to do? Be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost? Absolutely not. The Son and Jesus Christ are absolutely the same person. <laughs> uh, and you should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, well, you know, we will ask ourselves, you might say, well, these are things that happen simultaneously or these things happen progressively or these things that happen, in, um, you know, sequentially. Um, and, and so we can ask certain questions, but we don't want to jump to conclusions yet. OK, so now once again, we can go back over to uh, let's let's go back over to Acts chapter eight. And let's just look at verse 37. We're not going to look at necessarily at this moment in time uh, what we're actually studying out in Acts 8, 15 through 17, because we already understand that formula. That formula was that Philip down, went down and preached, and um, every one of them that were saved had simply believed upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or they had called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and they had been baptized. And so once again, what we're saying concerning that is they were most definitely saved. And so what we're going to do and that, and we're also saying based upon those, that information that we've received up to this point in our, in our study is that they had received the Holy Spirit as well, because you, when you're saved, you're born of the spirit, you're begotten of God. Um, another thing is you become the temple of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and so we can go on and on with all of these various just different ways of saying the same thing. But now let's look real quickly at Acts 8, 37. And Philip said, if you would believe with all of your heart, responding to um, the eunuch's request now of what he must do to be saved, Philip just simply says, if you will believe with all of your heart, let me just check, see what time it is real quickly. Yeah, I've got a few more minutes. If you will believe with all of your heart, you uh, you may. Well, let me back up, get get the context a little bit more. So verse 36, and every, uh, see, and as they went on their way, they came into a certain water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What does enter me to be baptized? <laughs> it's very interesting to look at this because you know, it seems as though Philip's just talking about explaining to him just the specifics of who Jesus is with respect to what Isaiah said. But we understand clearly that Philip had in his message a very strong emphasis on water baptism. He says, as they went on their way, they came into a certain water and the eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? And so he's already, we can assume, safely assume, he's already got this about who Jesus is. He's accepted Jesus in the sense that he is a Savior. He's the Messiah. I, I, I'm receiving him as Lord. And Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is simply the most important commonality within the salvific formula. If you're going to call it a formula, it's just uh, a way of expressing um, this uh, information. We're simply saying that over and again, the one common feature that you're going to see is that you must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when you take that out of the equation, then you're missing a very fundamental and important part of calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus. So it is indeed a condition. And so we can begin to write that down in our results. We can begin to, you know, as we're distilling our conclusions, we can put that down. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to search that out. We're going to search out. And how would you search that out? You would simply take you could take a phrase and put it in your search engine, son of God. You could have Jesus um, you know, in your search engine, uh, there's so many different ways to do it. Jesus, comma, son, comma, God. Some of uh, your search engines, all you have to do is just go Jesus, son, and God. And immediately it's just going to search those verses of scripture that have those three words in it. Okay, so we want to be able to go quickly, find how many verses of scripture there are on that, 
and then understand, wait a minute, this is a part of calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus and the criteria of salvation. And then we would ask the question, did the Samaritans believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God? And, um, you know, certainly we could say that if they didn't, mm, that Philip would have made sure that they did because it's the same preacher, okay? Because we can't argue from silence. It doesn't exactly say that, okay? This is very important. It doesn't exactly say that in those verses of Scripture as it applies to the Samaritans. However, the context and the preacher, um, you know, well, the preacher is the same, so the context is the same. And as much as he would have emphasized this to the eunuch, then we could safely be assume that he also emphasized that, or we can be certain, did he also emphasize the same thing uh, to the Samaritans who had been saved. And I've run out of time already. I, I hope this has helped you and that you grow in your Bible study. This is about your personal Bible study. It's about you understanding how to quickly get to all of the information on a particular subject and to really hold back from jumping to conclusions until you've got all the information on the topic. Okay, love you. Bless you in Jesus' name. See you next week.